Thank you very much. It's a uh, privilege to be here. I, I didn't remember how long it had been, but um, <clears throat> the uh, first topic they gave me uh, for this evening uh, is uh, Mormonism. Now, I think most of you are probably very familiar with <clears throat> Mormonism. I was to talk about the origins, false doctrines and practices, and how to witness to Mormons. Uh, I could give you a lot of details, uh, false prophecies of Joseph Smith. We could prove that he's a false prophet. Uh, in 1835, he predicted or he prophesied within 56 years Christ would return. It didn't happen. He prophesied the destruction of the United States government. And we could go on and on <clears throat> with false prophecies from him, from Brigham Young, and from others. Uh, we could talk about Joseph Smith, the glass looker, and how he was uh, arrested for fraud, and, and, and the polygamist, and how he gets new revelations to uh, justify his polygamy. Uh, we could talk about the contradictions, uh, doctrine and covenants. Uh, I have a copy of it here, uh, 132, <clears throat> that said you couldn't get to heaven you couldn't really be exalted to godhood unless you were a polygamist and so forth. Well, they changed that when the United States government wouldn't let them practice it. We can give you a lot of, of um, reasons um, why this is a cult, uh, the same mind control, the same idea that we have one leader, Joseph Smith. You can't get to heaven except with his approval. Uh, you must do what the church teaches when the leaders speak, the thinking has been done. Uh, all of these uh, things we could, we could deal with. Uh, we don't have time in uh, the 40 minutes that I have to adequately cover those things. I would like to um, deal with something a little more basic uh, that you would find helpful uh, in talking to anyone. I, I fly about 150,000 miles a year. Uh, because I fly so many miles, United Airlines puts me in first class. It doesn't cost me anything. I sit next to some very interesting people, uh, chief executive officers of large corporations uh, and international business leaders and so forth. And um, I find uh, certain basic things are very helpful to understand in talking with any of these people. Uh, first of all, uh, for all of us and all of the talks that I will be giving and others will be giving, we, we have to understand, we have to establish some basic ground rules. <clears throat> uh, number one, two contradictory propositions can't both be true. That's simple. Uh, but you would find it's amazing uh, how many people, for example, I, I forgot to bring it this evening, but I have a, a, a book uh, titled how wide the divide. It's a discussion between uh, two professors. One of them is a Mormon and one of them is an evangelical Christian. And it has the endorsement of many uh, leading Christians, uh, even cult watchers, saying this is a groundbreaking book. Oh, this is fantastic. Um, and they, they have a dialogue and then they decide, well, we're not so far apart after all. Um, well, wait a minute, people who talk about God, I've got to decide what do they mean <clears throat> uh, by God. People who talk about Jesus Christ, we have to decide what do they mean. Are we talking about the same thing? So you have documents like evangelicals and Catholics together, for example. Uh, that goes back a few years. <clears throat> now, that was uh, drawn up with the approval of the Vatican, but drawn up by uh, Charles Colson, who was a lawyer, and he deliberately drew it up so Catholics and evangelicals could both sign this thing having different meanings for key words. Uh, now, you can't uh, say that this is an agreement, and we've got to get certain basic ground rules straight, uh, or we can't even have a discussion. Now, there are things that seem to be contradictory uh, in the Bible, for example. If there are real contradictions that cannot be reconciled, then throw the Bible out. It simply isn't true. 
Uh, but if there are things that seem to be contradictory, for example, in the four, there seem to be some contradictions between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. For example, uh, one of the Gospels says, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me thrice. Another one, uh, the other two uh, that deal with this say, before the cock crows, you will deny me thrice. Well, which is it? Is this a contradiction? Uh, we go into a lot of those things in one of my books out there called In Defense uh, of, of the faith. Well, if you went into a courtroom and you had four people testifying and each one parroted the other word for word, <laughs> I wouldn't trust them. This is a setup. But if each one, if they seem to contradict one another, even at key points, but when you examine it, you get down to the truth, you find out they're saying the same thing, then you have a solid case. So this is why there are some uh, things that seem to be contradictory in the Bible. Uh, well, sometimes my wife says to me, why is the Bible so complicated? I mean, uh, why can't it just be laid out plain? Well, you know, a, a jigsaw puzzle, for a child, a jigsaw puzzle maybe has 20 pieces. If you get a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle, uh, and it takes uh, a lot of work to get this thing together. But when this thing all fits together, you really have something. Uh, and uh, this is what truth is. We can't just uh, uh, believe things that are contradictory, but the whole thing has to fit together. I uh, give you some examples. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to get into the details on these, but there are some people who say, well, man, how can God be sovereign and man has a free will? Or how can man have a free will if God is sovereign? And then there's some people who would say, well, the Bible teaches both. These are two parallel lines that never meet. And they seem to be contradictory one to another, but we can't reconcile them. Now, you, you just can't go through life like that. <laughs> If you can't reconcile it, then there's something wrong. Now, if you have contradictory things and you're going to believe both of them, you could prove anything. You understand? I mean, uh, I could prove that this guy murdered this person even though he wasn't even in the vicinity when the murder took place. Uh, so a, a detective or a lawyer has to put a case together. Okay, that's all I'm trying to say. So whatever you're dealing with, whether it's the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons, whether it's an atheist, whoever it is, uh, we've, we've got to realize, first of all, you can't have contradictory things and say, well, you mean you're talking about God, he's talking about God, but you mean different things. We've got to find out uh, what we're talking about. You can't say that Benny Hinn, for example, <clears throat> who makes false prophecies, one after the other, you can't say he's a true prophet. <laughs> Uh, you can't say that Joseph Smith, who made false prophecies, is a true prophet, or that Kenneth Copeland or Kenneth Hagin, people who make false prophecies, you can't just say, but, but I'm going to believe them anyway. Now, you have to be willing to face the facts, to face the truth. And I find people, even evangelical Christians in churches, they're not willing to face the facts about, about certain people. We've got to be willing to do that. It's like, you know, you have the prophet movement today. Uh, and um, they say, well, of course, we're not always right, but we're, we're learning. They call it the school of the prophets. Uh, and, and they say, but, you know, you, to be a prophet, you're not necessarily 100% right. Well, you could imagine Jeremiah saying, well, just, uh, just ignore chapters 14 and 39 because I, I, wasn't, I was just practicing then, you know. Uh, <laughs> It, it is either true or it is false. We just have to get some uh, simple ideas straight. Now, you can't say, I don't care whether it's Billy Graham or whether it's the Pope or, or myself or whoever it is. If they teach something contradictory to the Bible, you can't just overlook that. You can't say, well, that's okay, you know. Uh, well, but most of what they say is true. Well, that's like rat poison. Rat poison, in fact, is 99.6% nutritious. It just has enough poison to kill rats. And if, if it didn't taste good, the rats wouldn't want it. So there is a real problem with mixing a, a truth uh, with, with error. You can't, you can't believe in evolution in the Bible, for example. Not even theistic evolution. Uh, the Pope believes it. <clears throat> Billy Graham says it's okay. 
Promise Keeper says it's okay. <clears throat> Christianity Today had an editorial saying it's okay, but there's no way that you can reconcile, like uh, uh, Cardinal O'Connor, who, who died recently, uh, but uh, Cardinal O'Connor said Adam and Eve were a couple of anthropoid, ape-like creatures. Well, you can't reconcile a male and a female evolving and dying, evolving and dying, evolving and dying side by side. You can't reconcile that with God creating Adam out of the dust of the ground. Adam was around for a while. Uh, he, he named the animals. God saw that he was lonely, he put him to sleep, took a rib and made a man. Uh, I'm sorry, made a woman. Now, you can't reconcile those two. You understand what I'm saying? You can't reconcile um, evolution even theistic evolution, the Pope says, we will not, we will not compromise on this. <clears throat> yes, they did evolve, but God finally, he put a human soul and spirit in them and will not compromise on that. Now, you can't possibly reconcile that with Romans chapter 5, for example. As by one man's sin entered into the world and death by sin, well, wait a minute, if you got these critters evolving and dying, evolving and dying, before Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve are standing on a, on a, a you know, pile of fossils uh, of dead critters, you can't possibly reconcile it. Uh, so you've got to decide what are we gonna believe, what is our authority? And if I can't accept what the Bible says about the origin of man, why should I accept what the Bible says about the, uh, about the destiny of man. If I can't accept what the Bible says literally about man's sin and his separation from God, why should I believe what the Bible says about man's reconciliation to God and, and the redemption uh, that is in Christ Jesus? So we've got to, first of all, we're gonna think. <laughs> we've gotta think straight. And we can't just uh, overlook error and say, but most of what they say is right. We can't just uh, say, well, it seems to be contradictory, uh, but that's okay. Uh, anyway, we were, I was kind of joking with them. Uh, coming out uh, today, we saw a, a rainbow, in fact, a, a double one a, a little bit, and uh, I was saying, well, I, there shouldn't be a rainbow here. I mean, how come there's a rainbow here? Because God put a rainbow in the sky uh, to show that there wouldn't be a flood again, but it was a local flood, so you gotta go to Mesopotamia to see a rainbow. There shouldn't be one over here, you know. Uh, well, we have people um, like Hugh Ross, for example, on James Dobson's program. Hugh Ross says the flood was about 22 feet deep. It was a local flood over there. Uh, uh, wait a minute, why did, why did Noah have to bring two of every kind of animal. They could have just gone to high ground. It doesn't make sense. Uh, and, and, and Peter uh, and Jesus likened the coming judgment. Says the world that then was was destroyed by water. The world that is one, one day will be destroyed by fire. But I wouldn't be concerned. It was a local flood, it'll be a local fire. <laughs> so all, all I'm trying to say is you can't believe contradictory things. And you have to decide uh, what are we going to believe. <laughs> well, the, I, I just want to concentrate on, on just a couple of things uh, here um, in, the, in the time that we have. If I'm dealing, I don't care who I'm dealing with, I've got to start with God first. Okay? And there are many ways to prove that God exists. Uh, and this is very important in Mormonism. Who is God to a Mormon? This is the very foundation. Uh, in fact, uh, Joseph Smith uh, said that, well, he said, God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens, that is the great secret. Well, it's not a secret, of course, that was the offer of the serpent uh, to, to Eve in, 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 in the garden. But now, now we got a problem. We're real, we got a lot of problems. Uh, if God is a man who 
was once a man like we are, you know, the, the Lorenzo Snow, the most famous saying in Mormonism, as man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. Now, if God was once a man, but the Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God said, let us make man in our image. If God made man, how could God have been a man before he was a God? Uh, it doesn't, you, you, are you following me? You can't believe contradictory things. Uh, who was the God that created the man who became the God that created Adam? Uh, <laughs> It doesn't, it, it doesn't make any sense, and you can't just sh shrug it off. Now, I can talk to scientists, I can talk to atheists, and I can reason something like this. Uh, we know that this universe hasn't been here forever, right? How do we know the universe hasn't been here forever? Very simple. If it had been, the sun would have burned out by now, right? Uh, we're talking about forever now. If it had been here forever, the sun would have burned out, right? All the other stars would have burned out. It's something called the second law of thermodynamics. It's called the law of entropy. Uh, energy runs down like a clock. The, the universe is running down like a clock, so we know it wasn't here forever. Now, it's taken scientists a long time to come to that conclusion, but I think, and I'm not a scientist, but I think most of them are pretty well agreed, there was a beginning to the universe. You, you can't deny it. <laughs> well, how does the Bible start? What are the first three words? In the beginning. Ooh, we got that one right. <laughs> well, maybe we ought to pay some attention to this book. And I often tell people, you know, you, you can't become an expert on every religion. You wouldn't live long enough to study them all. I'll tell you how to save a lot of time. Go to the Bible first. The Bible says all the rest of them are wrong. Now, if we can prove that the Bible is true, then you save a lot of time. And we must be able to prove the Bible is true. I want to get into that in, in, a, in a few moments. Or we, why would we believe what the Bible says if I can't prove that it's true? Uh, so we know there was a beginning. Well, what was the beginning? Well, it was a big bang. Really? Well, that's interesting. <clears throat> Why did it bang just then? And how out of a bang did you get the human brain? Uh, and where was the energy hanging around to make this bang? You see, you couldn't have had energy hanging around forever because it would have entropied before it could bang. Uh, so we know, I mean, just simple logic, we know there was a time when no thing existed no matter, no material, because it runs down like a clock, law of entropy. Now we got a problem between the first and second law of thermodynamics. We got a real problem. The scientists haven't been able to work this one out yet because the first law, the law of conservation of energy says, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. But if energy can't be created, but it can't last forever, then there had to be a beginning to energy itself, right? But it can't be created. Well, we don't know how to create it. There must have been a time when no thing existed, okay? You can't argue with that. But someone, someone who could create everything out of no thing, out of nothing. This is the God of the Bible. This is not the God of, 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 the, um, of the Mormons. Joseph Smith said, matter and intelligence have always existed. They're without beginning. Well, Joseph Smith was simply wrong. It's not scientific, it isn't true, because matter couldn't have been here forever. And the Mormon gods are, did not create out of nothing. They had to have material to create uh, out of. Uh, something, they had to have something to create out of, but something couldn't have been hanging around forever, okay, you with me? All right, so what does the Bible say? What's the next word in the Bible? In the beginning, what? God. God created the heavens and the earth. Now, it doesn't say um, the God of this world created this world and the heavens around here. It only talks about one heaven and one earth. 
Uh, He made the stars also. Now in Mormonism, in the Mormons, uh, well, some earlier Mormons were very bold uh, about this. Uh, Orson, Apostle Orson Pratt, for example, said, quote, if we should take a million of worlds like this and number their particles, he didn't know what to call them, uh, we should find that there are more gods and there are particles of matter in those worlds. The gods who dwell in the heavens have been exalted also from fallen men to celestial gods to inhabit their heaven forever and ever. Now, the Mormons have more gods than the Hindus. Hindus only have about 330 million. But, <laughs> but, well, according to Joseph Smith, this has been going on forever. So there must be trillions up there. There's not only a father in heaven, but there's a grandfather in heaven and a great-grandfather and a great-great-great-grandfather and also a mother god and, and a lot of them up, up, up there. Uh, as, as well, and I'm not trying to be funny, I'm just trying to be logical. Uh, the, you can't believe two contradictory things, <laughs> okay? You can't believe <laughs> that there was a time when nothing except God existed, <laughs> and he made this universe, and he created man, but then, but God was once a man before he created this universe, before he became God, Come on, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit scientifically, it does not fit logically, and it is not biblical. Uh, So we've got to decide what are we going to believe. Now, the heavens declare the glory of God, the Bible says. You can, well, Romans chapter 1, Paul says they are all without excuse. God's eternal power and Godhead are clearly seen in the things that he made. You cannot look at this universe without acknowledging it has been created. It didn't just happen. I mean, I could go into all kinds of things. We could talk about, in fact, if you don't get our newsletter, you're, wel- you're welcome to sign up for it. I think we have a sign-up sheet out there. And I think in January, we did a, an article called The Living Word of God. We just talked a little bit about DNA. Uh, Darwin knew nothing about DNA. Uh, It's incredible. Maybe you don't know this, but uh, I don't remember whether, have they just finished it uh, in near New York or they're about to finish the world's fastest computer. It costs a hundred million dollars for the one computer. It will do one quadrillion calculations a second. Now that's a one with 15 zeros after it. In a second, It's called Blue Gene, G-E-N-E. Why are they building this computer? The first task they're going to give it is to try to figure out how the body makes one protein molecule. They're going to run Blue Gene at one quadrillion calculations per second, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for one year to try to solve one problem, how the body makes one protein molecule. It does it that fast. All happen by chance? You gotta be kidding. It's impossible. But now, I could give you the mathematics for the, you know, how you're gonna line up all of these um, protein molecules in the right order by chance? It couldn't happen. Mathematically, it's impossible. It's more than that. It's more than that. This is information. We all begin as a single cell. How does this cell know how to build a body? It has DNA encoded on it, and DNA exactly replicates itself on every cell that it makes. That's how a liver cell knows it's a liver cell. That's how, you know, various cells of the body know what they are. But these are manufacturing instructions. This is information. This is language. In fact, it is coded. It is encoded and it must be decoded. Now look, there's information here on the pages of this book. It's it's paper and it's written in ink. The paper and ink did not originate the information, right? That's simple. The information that is on this page indicates another source, an intelligent source of information that originated it. And the DNA did not originate the information that's on it a non-physical source 
Put that information there. And by the way, talk about storage of information. If you took the information in a pinhead's worth of DNA and you put it in books, it would take a stack of books 500 times as high as the distance from here to the moon to contain the information. Now these are words. This is language. This is intelligent order that you cannot explain this away. Okay? So when you look at the, at the world around you, and the more science learns, the more we realize this was created by an incredible God. Okay, but it tells me of his power and his wisdom. It doesn't tell me of his love. It doesn't tell me of his purpose. Doesn't tell me of his plan for mankind. How am I going to know that? He's going to have to reveal himself. He's going to have to reveal himself in such a way that I can understand it. See, that's one of the problems with the cult. Whether it's Joseph Smith, or whether it's the leader of the Boston Church of, of Christ, uh, or the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, whoever it is, they take control. The Mormons, you can't dispute what they say. You have to accept what they say. That is not the way God works. We call our ministry the Berean Call. We take that from Acts 17 and 11 because it tells us that the Bereans were more noble than those in the town of Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and they searched the scriptures daily to see whether what Paul said was true. Now we've got to have an authority. I don't care who you are. An atheist, if we have an atheist here tonight, you've got to have an authority. You go, why? Because we don't know everything. We can't do everything. You go to a doctor. He writes out a prescription in a hand you can't even read. You hand it to, you hand it to a, a pharmacist, and he puts together compounds, which even if he told you the names, you wouldn't know what they are. And you adjust this. Because if you said, Doc, wait till I go through four years of medical school, you know, and several years of specialization, then, then I'll believe you. No, you can't check up on it. And none of us has been the other side of death. If we don't have an authority, someone who knows. I was being interviewed on a radio station in Southern California. I see what really bothers me is I just find people don't think. And, and I find Christians don't think. And we're not teaching our young people in our Sunday schools to think. And when they get, when they face university, that's when they get confused because they got people who face them with questions and they can't answer them. And we taught them to memorize some verses and some rote answers, but they've got to think for themselves. Now, I was being interviewed on this program in Los Angeles every Sunday night. It's called Spiritual Seeker. It's a secular show. And the, uh, the host begins something like this. He says, well, for two hours every Sunday night, we have the, this is spiritual secret. We have the privilege to talk about God, religion, and spirituality. And we have a panel of experts in the studio to do it. Well, I just have some simple questions for them. Uh, I said, spiritual seeker? What have you been seeking? <laughs> how, how long have you been seeking it? And what have you found? What did you expect to find? And how would you know it if you found it? Now, you got a panel of experts to talk about God. How do you become an expert on God? I mean, instead of sitting around and talking about God, wouldn't it make more sense to find out what God has said about us? And if God hasn't said anything, forget it. I'm not interested in sitting around with people and dialoguing your opinion, my opinion, this opinion. Yeah, you understand what I'm trying to say? We must have an, a communication from God. We've got to. And it can't be something that Bill down here, oh, he's the only one that can interpret it. <laughs> or Jacob over here. I, he'd love to be a cult member, I'm sure. I mean, a leader. I mean, a leader, a cult leader. Yeah. Look, look, if you've got to go to a leader, if it's got to be your pastor, or whoever it is, and they're the only ones who can interpret it for you, you are not in touch with God. 
What does the Bible say? Well, it says in, in Deuteronomy 8, and Jesus quoted, well, I better hurry up here. Jesus quoted in the, in, in the temptation of the wilderness. It doesn't say a rabbi shall not live by bread. It says a man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Now, wait a minute. That does away with the Bible codes right there, just that fast. If you've got to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, but there are certain hidden messages that you have to have a sophisticated software and a computer to get at them, then it doesn't work, folks. I mean, uh, you, you just can't accept this. Psalm 1, blessed is the man. In his law doth he meditate day and night. Psalm 119.9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? Well, he's got to go to the rabbi. He's got to check it out with a cult leader. No, no. By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Okay? Uh, Paul writes to Timothy, from a child, 2 Timothy 3.15, from a child you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus. Who did he learn it from? Well, his father was a rabbi. No, his father was a Greek. He learned it from his mother and grandmother. That was homeschooling back there. And they schooled him in the Bible, and he could understand it, okay? If that's not true, then we're not in touch with God, all right? Now, what does the Bible say? Well, what does the Bible say about, about God? It says some interesting things about God. Um, how does God introduce himself to Moses? Exodus chapter 3. I am that I am. He says, what is your name? I am that I am. What does that mean in, in John 8 when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I was? Is that what he said? No, no. Before Abraham was, I am. Yahweh, the self-existent one without beginning, without end, whose existence depends upon none other but himself, all the existence of all creatures and all things depends upon me. Then he couldn't have been a man one time back there. From ever, Psalm 90, verse 2, of prayer of Moses, the man of God. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. We could give you verse after verse. I, the Lord, change not. God is not a man that he should lie, and so forth. It goes on and on and on. Now, this is the God that must exist. If what, if what science tells us about the second law of thermodynamics, if what our own brain tells us, there had to be a time when no thing existed, but there was someone, and he had no beginning. That's not the God of the, the, the pagans, you know, the gods of the Greeks, or, 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 or you've got all kinds of nonsense out there. Uh, but the Bible goes right to the heart of it. It gives you the true God, who he must really be. Now, the Bible faces us. Now, someone else is going to talk about the Trinity. You know, the Trinity is absolutely essential, and I, and, and I don't want to steal from his speech. But, you know, for example, on one end, you have polytheism. Uh, you've got a lot of people here on the, on the islands that are native religion polytheists. And one of your volcanoes is a, is a god and so forth. Uh, well, the problem with polytheism is you've got diversity but no unity. The gods fight one another. They steal one another's wives. There's no peace in heaven. There can be no peace on earth. On the other end, you've got Allah, not the God of the Bible, but a, a single entity or what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe or what many Jews think. Yahweh, Jehovah is a single in entity. Well, you've got unity, but no diversity. What do we mean by that? Well, before this single God created any beings, he was incomplete. He couldn't experience fellowship, love, communion. He had to create other beings in order to have this. But the Bible says, God is love. The Father loved the Son, and so forth. I mean, we don't have time, but I can go down through philosophy, I can go down through science, and, and I can contrast it with the pagan religions and all the false ideas of God, and I can take you to the Bible, and I can show you that the Bible has it right, as it must be uh, for God to be God. Now, 
The Bible also confronts us with another problem, and this is where all the cults go astray. Well, we just heard it all, all, already uh, today. We have broken God's laws. And just in the moments that I have, let me just give you some examples, some illustrations that I use that you would find helpful. And I think helpful in dealing with cult members or, or whoever it is. You know, it's a matter of justice. That's the problem between God and man. God said the soul that sinneth, it will die, right? Now that doesn't mean just physical death. That means eternal separation from God. We are rebels. You know how serious it is? We're all thieves. Oh, I never stole anything. Yes, you are worse than a thief. We have taken the life and existence that God has given us. He created us. We've taken the life and existence he's given us, and we have torn it out of his hands, and we thought we would live it for ourselves. And that is a serious crime. We have forfeited the right even to be in God's universe. But God loves us. And because he loves us, God became a man. He didn't cease to be God. He'll never cease to be man. I go into all the arguments of the, uh, of the Mormons. Well, the fact that, that Jesus became a man and that then a man went back up and became God again, well, that shows that men can become gods. You know, if a million Mormon males living on the earth today all achieve their ambition of becoming gods, you got another million more gods out there. But the Bible says there is one God in Isaiah, he says, is there a God beside me? I know not any. He says, look, I checked this thing out. Uh, I've searched this whole universe. There is no other God. All other gods are false gods. You're talking about to Jehovah's Witnesses. They'll take you to, to uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, for example. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is this God. And then they say the Word was a God. And, and, you know, well, let's count the gods in this verse. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, spelled big G. Who's that? Well, that's the true God. And the Word was a God, it's little g. Well, who's that? Oh, that's Jesus. Well, is he a false God? Oh, no, no, we wouldn't say he's a false God. Wait a minute, for all you talk about one God, you got two gods. You got a big God and a little God. You got God the Father, who's the big God. Then you got Jesus, he's a little God. And well, and the Mormons all want to become gods. That was the lie of the serpent, wasn't that what the serpent promised? Eve in the garden. So the Bible says there's one God, one mediator between God and men. There's a distinction between God and men. God said, let us make man in our image. Well, now, wait a minute. The Mormon says, yeah, but we'll be in his likeness. That means we're going to be gods. No, it doesn't. We were already made in his image. By the way, it's something good to think of when these, all these people talk about self-image and self-esteem and self-love and self-ad nauseum, and on and on it goes. When you think of an image, you think of a mirror, right? A mirror has one purpose and one purpose only. That is to reflect a reality other than its own. Now, what would you think of a mirror that tried to develop a good self-image? It doesn't fit. We're made in the image of God, but that didn't mean we were gods then. And it doesn't mean that when he brings us into heaven, like his son, when we see him, we will be like him, doesn't mean we'll be gods. <laughs> now, we got a problem. We've broken God's laws. We have forfeited the right to be in his universe. The wages of sin is death. You want your wages? The gift of God is eternal life. It's a matter of justice. God himself cannot make a bookkeeping entry in heaven. He can't just pat you on the head and say, that's okay, I'll just let you go this time. That's all right. God himself cannot do it. You've got to understand that. You've got to help people understand it. You know, let's say that I, uh, we live in Bend, Oregon. Uh, I just, um, uh, went 120 miles an hour through a school zone, 20 miles with kids present, and I got arrested last week. And when I get back to, to Ben, I'm standing before the judge, and you're gasping while wow, they'll throw the book at you. I say, don't worry about it. I know the judge's mother. Uh, no, that's what the Catholics think, you know. Mary will get them off. 
Wait a minute, that's corruption. It is a matter of justice. Jesus, on his knees in the garden, he pleaded with his father, if there's any other way, don't make me go through with this. The father said there's no other way, the penalty must be paid. And as Jesus gave his spirit into his father's hands, he said, to telestai, in the Greek. They stamped that on promissory notes, on documents in that day, it meant paid in full. And unless Jesus paid the penalty in full, there is no salvation. You gotta understand that. You gotta help people understand that. God can't let you off. It won't work. Only because the penalty was paid. And if you do not accept that penalty as having been paid in your place, you are not saved. I mean, I can give you many verses, but I'm trying to rush. I got about one minute left here. Uh, now, now this is a gift. This is a gift. Look, this dear man down here, I just have taken such a liking to him. He's been smiling so nicely. And I've got a painting that we just discovered in our basement. It's a Rembrandt. It's worth several hundred million dollars. I'd like to give it to you. And, and he says, Dave, I'll give you a penny for it. Now, he's done two things. Sorry, brother. He's done two things. Number one, he's insulted me, right? Offer me a penny for a priceless painting? That's an insult. You offer God anything. Now, that's what all the cults, they're going to do it by their works, by their performance. You offer, that includes the Catholic Church, sacramentalism, ritual, baptism, whatever it is. You offer God anything, you are insulting him. Christ paid for this at infinite cost. And you're going to offer him something in exchange? That's an insult. Number two, you have rejected the gift. He's rejected the gift just by offering me a penny for priceless painting. You cannot do that. We can't think of, we can't accept two contradictory things. As a Catholic, I can't accept that Christ paid the full penalty and that he's being sacrificed as this little wafer on the altar over and over and over and over. You cannot believe two contradictory things. I've got to come to this conclusion and I've got to confront people with this. Well, Mormonism is wrong on God. It's wrong on man. It's, you know, we're the spirit brothers of Lucifer and of Jesus. Uh, Mormonism is wrong on Jesus Christ, who he is. Uh, he was the spirit brother of Lucifer. He, he had to come to this earth to get a body to, in order to become a god, you know, and so forth. Uh, Mormonism is wrong on salvation. It, it, you know, salvation, they've got a temple here. You go into the temple and you go through these magic rituals and you're, that starts you on what Joseph Smith said is a journey upwards. It could take eons of time to become a God. That's what they call eternal life. That's exaltation to Godhood. They've got everything uh, is, is wrong, but they will use the same words, the same language, the same ideas. Every Easter you get something uh, that comes and says, uh, we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. At this time, we accept the resurrection, etc." They can sound like evangelical Christians. They have different meaning for key words. You've got to get to the heart of it. Uh, and this is what we have to uh, consider, whether we're facing an atheist, a Mormon, a Jehovah's Witness, just a friend. Uh, We've got to decide on the meaning of words. You can't believe contradictory propositions. We've got to have an authority. And I can prove that the Bible is God's word and I've run out of time. But we can prove the Bible is God's word. We've got archeological evidence. We've got historical evidence. We've got prophetic proof that the Bible is God's word. You got none of it for the Book of Mormon. They can't even find a pen. Uh, I mean, we've got museums around the world that have piles of, of, of documentation, of proof that the Bible is God's word. We've got a map of, of Israel. We know where these cities were and so forth. They can't find one city that's named in the Book of Mormon. They can't find a bay, the river, the mountain. They can't find anything. It is a total fraud. But we have absolute proof that the Bible is God's word. And this is our authority. The reason it's our authority is not because we're fanatics, not because we've got some kind of devotion to some church or some denomination. 
but it's because we can absolutely prove it. And this is God's word and it's our authority and this is what we're going to go by.